Randall Harden is the recipient of the Gwilin Brooks Poetry Award, the B. Gonzalez Poetry Award, and most recently, a National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship in Literature. A Kavi Cannon Fellow, a member of the Afrolation Poets, and a member of the symphony, the house that Etheridge built. Mr. Harden is Assistant Professor of English at the University of New Haven. How's everybody doing? All right. First of all, I want to thank um, Quincy and Black Renaissance for inviting me to read. I'm going to read an excerpt from um, <clears throat> this in progress uh, creative nonfiction piece I'm working on. Um, basically, what it is, it's a um, series of epistles. It's called Letters to L. And it's sort of loosely memoir and um, sort of these epistles that go back and forth for this young woman that's incarcerated. And so we sort of talk about the present industrial complex, um, aesthetics, all kind of things. So there's an um, excerpt in here. So here we go. <clears throat> Along with the poets Jean Murillo, Reginald Dwayne Betts, and Marcus Jackson, I helped form the symphony, the house that Etheridge built. Etheridge Knight has deeply influenced our poetic imagination, and his themes of love and location appear throughout our individual writings. This weekend, we are conducting a workshop and reading at Park University. <clears throat> Not more than six months ago, we were at the University of South Carolina to do a reading and workshop at a juvenile detention center with young men Park University is using us full poets as a recruiting tool because, for starters, we are peering through their Ethnic Voices reading series. The workshop will be with young creative writing students across the region. However, that is not what is on my mind today. I am more concerned with Elle, who once told me I carry a dead weight on my shoulders, an insolence in my walk that speaks of prison. The main reason being that she too has seen the inside raise a wine brick understood how time can squeeze a person's brain until it's nothing more than a hum. When I was in earning my PhD at SUNY Albany, she had returned to school upon completing a three-year prison sentence. Elle became my closest friend at SUNY because she understood more so than anybody what it was like to carry the stain of a jail cell. After Elle graduated, she returned back to New York City to continue her studies in graduate school at Lehman College. Two weeks before I was to head to Kansas City, L friends calls to inform me she has been arrested. She gave a friend a ride that was under FBI surveillance, and when they stopped the car, the authorities found 37 kilos of cocaine in a friend's suitcase. Just like that, in an instant, L is back inside razor wine brick. We have been corresponding via email, and I can only imagine the nightmare. Her last email informed me she received a copy of my driver's license and hoped I would, be I would be approved to come visit. She wrote, Hi, Randall. I got a copy of your identification last night. Thanks for sending it. I will give it to Miss Hill today. I've been thinking about you and your book. I hope it is well. I've been reading an author whose name is California Cooper. I really like her style. Have you ever heard of her? I got my hands on two of her books and read them so quickly I wish I had taken my time with them. I read Native Son, again, Love by Toni Morrison and a few other books, 14 to be exact since April the 13th. All the books have a common thread, choice and a person's calling. Every protagonist has a problem figuring out his or her mission in life. I started to ask the women here if they knew what they were in this world for and if they had a plan when they were going to get out. None of them had an answer for me, not even me. Yeah, I have dreams, which is more than I can say for most women here, because it seems like a lot of them stopped dreaming a long time ago, either when they caught their first beard or had their first child. It made me wonder about women and why we, are, why we tend to stop believing in ourselves when life seems to get rough or when it's just easy to get by and live day by day simply surviving, then dreaming of something better and actually go after it. There is something wrong mentally and spiritually with each one of us in here. An emptiness I can't explain, but I'm trying to figure it out every day. These white walls and gray trimmings have cast a shadow on their future. They seem to think, they seem to think if they can uh, see past their walls, they are okay. I look beyond these walls, sometimes even beyond this life, because I know there's more to it. Something inside me believes that this can't possibly be it. Maybe I'm a fool for still dreaming but I can't help it if I'm alive. <clears throat> and here's the 
And here's my response. Dear L, Haki Matabuti, an integral writer in the black arts movement that appeared between 1965 and 1975, once told me one could always tell the psychological and social condition of a nation and its cultural structures by the literature produced. Therefore, in my opinion, the literature of America, and I use America loosely, is destined to have themes of choice and calling, as you suggested, because of its fundamental belief in a free society, even if we act like we done lost our damn minds. Historically, some people's choices have been geared to suppress other people's choices, voices, check Marxism, and so to choose a path a unique path is revolutionary in our own mimetic society. Each person has to be his or her own protagonist, and I'm echoing Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Remember how the protagonist moved to other people's choices before making his own? And it is up to us as individuals, such as black, brown, and everybody from underneath language to somehow negotiate space on earth as we best know how. Failure doesn't mean we are not capable narrators of life's journey. However, even more than that, it means in failure resides triumph. Bottom line, we all got a little bigger in us. It may be inescapable to never catch the spirit of Western civilization. I am familiar with California Cooper's work, and I'm glad to see that you understand the power of literature as it equates to our own lives. Isn't choice the reason we as humans go through drama? We script our lives on reaction rather than action, meaning our daily life is always in response to, or reply to, or command or demand. The world uses us in that way. We are the backside of brainwash of society's failure, the after sound of oppression, but we know this maxim, and yet we become willing participants to our own commodification, which simply means we are caught up in the failure of capitalism. We become reified melodies in the architecture. The world does this to us, holds us down, I am certain. Then too, I've been thinking long and hard about the question you pose with regards to women and believing. Perhaps images in how we nurture young women as a society creates this insecurity. The American dream chokes little girls' dreams in so much as not all of them will be able to live up to ideal beauty as constructed by the benefactors of what I like to call the dominant narrative of those who dictate the ebb and flow of how we live. Beauty is a dangerous thing and know that brown and black women bear the weight of civilization in addition to their own which, weight which at times can be daunting. But more than that, the male plays a role in this insecurity, especially in these so-called streets by his rejection of the woman as equal counterpart and anything other than sexual object. We just want to love and have some warm body love us back. Objectification is a delicate balance. In other words, I saw it play out all too often with men who dominated women to the point they broke their spirit and stole their sound. The women couldn't speak of their own oppression because they had no language to express the unimaginable. It reminds me of pudding and sunshine from another life. Sunshine prostituted and pudding was a pimp main lover abuser wrapped in a six foot frame with a gold tooth. Sunshine loved pudding so much that she strolled around Logan Circle in DC every night selling the one commodity she knew well and that was herself. Here's the oxymoron. Sunshine never saw the light. Darkness choked to the death. Sunshine never get, got to understand we are the shadows in the dark novelist Toni Morrison talks about. We play between histories. Our sound originate from the breaking of sound. And then again, like life, language is only the beginning. And perhaps in death, too, comes a new beginning, a new language. Now skip to three. <clears throat> <clears throat> And this is the, the last part, one, part three of one of the excerpts. L, the marble eyes I've recently gazed through have been the same ones that ponder the autobiography of you, where you come from, where you've been, and where you are going. At any moment, I am inside your peripheral vision, imagining with exact description the six by nine cell you sleep in, and it's all its isolation because this is indeed something I can reinvent from memory. The gray cinder block that serves as the prison architectural foundation is always already present. The dull silvery ambience emitted from the toilet and sink explode into my pupils, creating a lackluster shine. Blue could be the sky somber temperament on a November day when the fading brown leaves that once seemed verdant swirl from trees nowhere in sight as you struggle to breathe free air. 
These matter-of-fact observations coincide with my thoughts on confinement and the bordering of color and how we as a society have imprisoned ourselves within the complexity of skin, as if our survival as human depend on this one specific thing. Of course, I can make a conscious effort to avoid color or not to invade your personal space trying to make a parallelism. parallelism. But history can be unforgiving in how the past reconstructs the future. For some reason, I feel our histories and futures intersect in so much as we come from the same memory. In other words, I have inhabited the cell door clang. So I can't ever escape the stagnant image of the pinstripe inmate constructed. There it is again, that word construct or construction, which is another word for confinement on someone else's term, a sort of deliberate scaffolding of a misguided structure. If I could go back to the initial moment after the formulation of Earth, I'm talking about the first glorious sunshine after the Big Bang. Have you ever wondered what the feeling could have been like if someone could have been present after the bang, the explosion of particle, antiparticle into space universal, suspended liquefied darkness, leptons and quarks melting to create human, prehistoric, the moon glow perfectly still, a second to bass alone original daylight of being, in the beginning, a delayed ocean, oceanic squirrel, swirl like blue, foliage like green, construction had not begun. If only someone could have stopped progress at that moment to have been there recording, recording perfect the day, to see something neoteric and novel coming off the horizon must have been glory, hallelujah. There is always a beginning, like the moment humans begin to differentiate between how much or how little melanin covered the flesh. I would love to have been there to stop the insanity before it began. But Earl, I guess you ponder on this night why I chose your eyes to reimagine and confront my own confinement. To be honest, I have seen what you see, and I know color dictates how you move now and how you will move the next day, even in prison. Call it familiarity. One of the reasons colors had consumed me is because of the artist painter Margaret Bolin. I sat down and talked with Margaret in February on the Lower East Side of Manhattan to interview her for the literary magazine title based on review, of which I am one of the editors. We were doing a feature on her paintings of an African-American girl called Jay. What makes, the world stun what makes the work stunning and remarkable is that the model has a light shot of white as if in white face, hinting at the concept Du Bois coined towards the 20th century. Double consciousness, chained to a way of seeing, a two-ness that haunts the beholder. The models are often depicted with cotton braided through their hair. At first, at first glance, there is a beauty in what the artist captures. However, one becomes drawn to Jay's eyes, the culture, pain, and trauma, coupled with the sadness of this little girl never being able to live up to the image of, that we as Americans have placed upon her, becomes an, anvil, an anvil around her heart. We revel in the beauty while drowning in the damaging commentary that is our nation's narration. We begin to talk about flesh and how there is no rationalization for painting flesh. It is an illogical concept based on how light illuminates over the surface and helps to project the image. After leaving our interview, I began to think deeply about my own imprisonment in flesh, which I equate to color. When I was in prison, I never thought about being in a prison within a prison, and I wonder, have you ever thought about time in this manner? As for myself, I am actually snapped back to the carcass I was, being eaten alive by the, by the vulture time is. Until recently, I never thought about how I swallowed the idea of color, hook, line, and sinker. L, we are all, we are all on life's proverbial hook being reeled in constantly by society's constructions. I mention your son, my nieces, the next generation counting on us but to prepare a place much better than we inhabit. And I know we have not succeeded. As a matter of fact, we have failed. <coughs> failed miserably. We war ourselves, we border ourselves, we kill ourselves, we are Latina, black, Asian, white, and because of history, never, and because of history we never truly rel relinquish identity, and so identity propels the narrative. I ask you to consider the evidence. A two-year-old baby boy in an apartment eight blocks from the detonation that killed four little girls in the basement of a church. All the little girls wanted to do was sing and somebody stole the hallelujah. The picture white baby Jesus knocked off the hook, the apartment shaking from a stick of, the stick, a stick of dynamite's echo. I heard and felt that echo. A two-year-old baby boy being constructed to understand black and white, to choose a side. I was a construct before I came of age. For so long, all I could do was think about was vanishing from prison, not even realizing I was in prison before incarceration, and I still languish behind invisible bars. I keep asking myself if this is the totality of my life, 
true. I am on the outside, but my inside is all tangled up still. If, I, if life is the sum of history, then how can I ever hope to escape this box? Whether I choose to acknowledge it or not, other people will, and there is no escaping this distinction. In other words, if you allow for me to quote Sartre for a minute when he says that once man uttered free, that once man uttered the word free, man was no longer free because his need to be identified as free proved he was chained. I say that I am free every day, but really, how free am I? Thank you.